So uh, today we're going to talk about um, how do we see the world? How do we develop flaws in our thinking, which we probably don't want to do? And how can we overcome the temptation to jump to early conclusions? Do you know the difference between observation and interpretation? So if I hold up two fingers, what comes to your mind? OK, so you have just demonstrated the difference between observation and interpretation. OK, so observation. Yes, interpretation. Peace, victory, whatever, right? But so I want to. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about how we form perceptions. OK, so the first thing we do is we take in the world through our through our senses, right? So taste, hearing, sight, smell, touch. So we're stimulated by those things, but we selectively perceive things, OK? We have selective attention. We pay attention to what will fill a need or is enjoyable. So do you go to every website? No, you go to the websites where you either want to uh, learn something, news or how to fix your garbage disposal or something, or you go to be entertained, watch a movie, watch cats flying off of ceiling fans, you know, good stuff like that. And we selectively expose our ourselves to messages that confirm our beliefs, contribute to our objectives, or prove satisfying. So we don't take in everything. You are not aware of everything. When you drove here this morning, you were not aware of everything around you. We have limited <clears throat> ability to take in our surroundings. This is a movie perception test. Watch this brief video of a conversation, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Hi, Sabina. Hi. Well, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Andrea. So how did you get here? Uh, I took the subway from Middleton, and it took only about half an hour. Really? I drove from Gresham, and it took 45 minutes. Hmm, hooray for public transportation. So why did you call me here for this mysterious meeting? I'm planning a surprise party for Jerome, and I need your help to keep him away from the house. That's great. I'll do anything you need. Good. I hate surprise parties, but only when I'm the victim. Otherwise, they're great. Very good. Other than the strange dialogue about a surprise party, did you notice anything unusual? In our book, The Invisible Gorilla and Other Ways Our Intuitions Deceive Us, we discuss the illusion of memory. We think we perceive and remember more of our world than we actually do. The movie you just watched had nine intentional editing mistakes. Did you spot any of them? Watch it again. Notice that the woman on the right, Sabrina, is wearing a scarf. In a moment we'll have a close-up and the scarf will be gone. Notice the scarf is gone and Andrea, the woman on the left, has her arm on the table. Now it's at her chin. Scarf is back. Notice that the plates are red. Now they're white and Andrea's arm is back on the table. Now they're red and Sabrina's arm is off of the table. Notice that the food is in front of Sabrina. Now it's in front of Andrea. The cups and the spoon have also switched places, and Sabrina's arm is on the table when it wasn't before. Most people don't notice any of the changes, a phenomenon known as change blindness. But most people are confident that they would notice the changes. That is the illusion of memory. Check out our book, The Invisible Gorilla, to learn more www.theinvisiblegorilla.com. The second thing we do is we organize. So we organize what we sensed by rules. We have, all have mental templates about how things are. You have mental templates about everything, north, south, east, west, where things are in your house, how to drive a car, all those things. We have these mental templates, and they give us a sense of how things are supposed to be, right? And when we experience things, we expect that they will continue to, we will continue exper to experience them in the same way, right? So you see people that have been interviewed after a disaster or after a crime. <gasps> I can't believe that happened on my street. It's never happened before. So we all have expectations. I think you had expectations coming here this morning. You know, you didn't think we were going to sit on pillows and beat drums and run around naked and things like that, right? Darn. You had an idea that there was going to be a speaker, darn. Okay. <laughs> All right. What was that? I said that's. Next oh, the next speaker. 
Okay, then the third stage is we tend to make an evaluation. We, det we determine what something means. Based on how we have organized things in our head, um, we, we determine what something means. It's influenced by our experiences, needs, wants, values, beliefs, how you think things should or should not be, expectations, and your physical and emotional state. Do you know the difference between denotative and connotative? So denotative is basically what the dictionary says, okay? Connotative is what does it mean to you? It's more of an emotional th sense. So if I say dog, and we look it up in the dictionary, it says a domesticated candid, uh, any carnivore of the dog family having prominent canine teeth in a wild state and a long slender muzzle. Is that how you tr speak to your dog? <laughs> when I go home, I don't go, oh, hello, canis familiaris of the canine, I don't do that, right? So what has been your experience with dogs? You know, do you see them as a threat? Do you see them as little kind things? Do you see them as cutesy? You know, your vision of a dog is based on your experience with dogs, right? You might say, my best friend, my furry loving companion. When I walk in the door, it's, hey babies, how you doing, right? Or if you've had bad experiences, you might say it's a scary beast that wants to eat me. <laughs> we are complicated people. We have our personality. We've been socialized through our culture, right, in terms of how we're supposed to think, what, how we're supposed to act, all those kinds of things. And they influence how we react in different situations. All right, the fourth stage is memory. Okay, so we commit things to memory. So first we observed, right? Then what did we do? We organized, we interpreted. The fourth stage is memory, but we store more than what happened. We also store our impressions. We store our interpretations of what happened in a particular situation. So you are not like a tape recorder that just sort of spits out what happened. You actually store to memory how you felt, like you meet somebody, you, you, you remember how you felt about them. You know, all those things, right? The fifth stage is recall. And recall is really a reconstruction process. So when you recall something, you actually have to re-put that, that, that sequence of events that you remember back together. You reconstruct what you've sensed into something meaningful. And it's actually a remembering of a particular event, right, that you remember. So we think that we're really good with this. There's been some research about flashpoint memories that people have when there's a big disaster and something goes on. People think that they have a really accurate memory, memory of where they were and what they were doing. So they did some research on where people were on 9-11. Do you know where you were on 9-11, 2001? People just knew what they, where they were and what they were doing. And then they interviewed them five years, 10 years later. And they found that they told different stories every time. So we think that we have this amazing memory, but we really don't. So you can see all the places where it can go south. What did we notice? How did we organize that based on our experiences? How do we commit it to memory? And, and then we have to reconstruct it every time, right? So what do you see? An apple, or what are some adjectives that come to mind? Red, red. juicy, juicy. Big, big apple, smooth, e. delicious. <laughs> delicious. Is it junk food? It's healthy, right? Yeah. Apple a day keeps the doctor away. Like, so you see how there are cultural constructs that come to mind? Because you have experience with an apple, right? I could show that to somebody in some part of the world where they don't have apples, and they would not have those same associations, right? What is that? Robert. That's a used apple, <laughs> right? Has a bite out of it. So, what does it come to mind? What comes to mind? Eve. Okay, Eve in the Garden of Eve in the Garden of Eden. Are there any uh, narratives that come to mind? Characters in movies, stories. Snow White, Snow White and the Poison Apple, right? Okay. So you see how there's a, there's baggage. You have baggage in your head, just right. It's it's the context in which you see a particular thing. Apple computers, actually Apple Inc. This was Apple computers, right? Yeah. 
And then they changed their logo at some point, and then, of course, rainbow has come to have a whole different meaning. But um, I could pull, I pull my students on this. I'm say, I say, okay, who likes Apple products? And they throw out adjectives like beautiful design, um, flawless compatibility with other products, um, innovative, you know, they, they give all these positive things. And then I ask my students, okay, those of you that don't like Apple products, what perceptions do you have? And they say things like, expensive, cult, closed system, overpriced, you know, those kinds of things, right? So we have different perceptions on things based on our experience. So what do you see here? Two faces, Two faces or a chalice. And here? Sax player and a face, right? How about here? You've seen these before. The young lady and the old lady? Which line is longer? They're the same length. They just appear different, right? This she has a fractured fibula. Given well, set it. So I can be able to go home tomorrow. Daddy's gonna be so excited. That killed him. Dr. Palmer, Dr. Barbara Palmer, dial 452. Hey, you. You got to Come on. AmeriQuest Mortgage, proud sponsor of the NFL. Look at the cute dog. So we, we tend to decide what something means way too quickly. And so a skill that we can work on is trying to delay what we observe and actually deciding what that particular thing means. But we do it so fast, it's like nanoseconds, right? So the main <coughs> points, we selectively perceive, we organize it based on who we are, which is a combination of all our experiences and all of our culture and everything. And then we decide what something means. So you've probably seen this, where if you blindfold a bunch of people and put them on different parts of the element, elephant, they're all going to have a different story in terms of describing what the elephant is like. And that's us. How about this guy? Do you think there are different perceptions on who this is? Does everybody know who this is? Colin Kaepernick, who, you know, to some, he's, he's a, a patriot. He's one fighting for all lives to matter, all right? Against pr police brutality, against brown people, right? And others interpret this as disrespectful to the military, disrespectful to the flag, he's a horrible person, blah, blah, blah. And of course, he doesn't have a job anymore. He's paid the price, right, for standing up for things. How about this? Some people look at the hat, make America great again, and think patriotism, yeah, we got to get back to the good old days, how things used to be when we had morality and we had prayer in schools and so forth. Other people look at that. I look at that, I find it really offensive. Um, so uh, some folks look at Trump and say, okay, he's a conservative, he's pro-business, he's not Hillary. I mean, that was a big thing in the last election, right? Placing conservative justices uh, and judges and justices. So even if even if he's got some flaws, he's doing really good stuff, right? Um, preserving family values, pro-life. That's his most recent alliteration. He wasn't always right. Not a Democrat. A man of the people, right? He's a gazillionaire, right? He's a, comes from a huge line of privilege, and. Um, he's anything but a man of the people. And yet, his rhetoric is such that he makes certain people feel like he's for them and, you know, 
it's all we're all just good people. God's choice. That is a huge one. Evangelicals by and large, truly believe that he is God's choice. Yes. And if he is God's choice, he is untouchable, right? So I He's persecuted like me. And a lot of people feel very persecuted. A lot of evangelicals feel very persecuted because people are trying to take away their guns, their rights, their ability to pray in school, so forth, right? Appointed by God, OK? Then you have other perceptions that Trump is corrupt, mentally unstable. And those of us that work in communication, I think, are fairly disturbed by the rhetoric that he uses. Um, a liar, uh, no moral center, fear monger, narcissist, a reality TV star, a fraud, looking out for number one, Aff affinity with dictators, thinks he's king. OK? Very different perceptions, right? And we all think, we're, we all know we're right. We don't just think we're right, we know we're right. It's not denial, it's just very selective. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. <laughs> we do that, right? So I teach intercultural communication and a, a universal reality is that from the time that we're born, we, just, we are taught who's in our group and who's not in our group, right? So who's in my group and therefore to be trusted who's not in my group and therefore to be looked upon with suspicion. So confirmation bias. We've already had a few inklings about that, right? It says literally the first link that agrees with you, what you already believe, is what you click on in, in Google. So confirmation bias is the seeking or interpreting of evidence in ways that are partial to existing beliefs, expectations, or a hy hypothesis. We find what we look for, right? Another de definition, the tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that is consistent with one's existing beliefs. So we have center, right? We have center and we have left and right, which are still terms that fail us. But we tend to go to the places that, that make us comfortable in terms of our existing worldview. But in fact, we really don't have much center anymore. Well, uh, I'll, yeah, I will. I think there's some, but you have to look for it. We build cases, right? There's an obvious difference between impartiality, impartially evaluating evidence in order to come to an unbiased conclusion and building a case to justify a conclusion already drawn. In the first instance, one seeks evidence on all sides of a question, evaluates it as objectively as one can, and draws the conclusion that the evidence in the aggregate seems to di dictate. In the second, one selectively gathers or gives undue weight to evidence that supports one position while neglecting to gather discounting evidence, right? That would work against us. Most people do not like to think. They don't like tough questions. They don't want to be challenged. People don't like change. Most people don't like change. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that, OK? So when you and I were growing up, where did we get our news? Yeah. Generally, in every town, there were two newspapers, right? We had radio, and we had three television networks, right? Everybody basically got their news from the same place. This is the world today. So we had this thing come along called the internet, which is wonderful. It's totally flattened the world. Everybody can have a voice. I even have my logo up there. Little old me can have a blog and a podcast. See their intentional journey. That's that's. My. We have YouTube. We have Pinterest and Instagram. We have bloggers. We have Facebook. We have podcasts. We have all this stuff, right? So what? Where do we get our news now? We're all getting our news from different places. Instead of there being a common stream, there's this. There's just this spaghetti. Right? A lot of people don't know the difference between fact and opinion. Then we have this thing called circular reporting. Let me just show you this short video. There's a quote usually attributed to the writer Mark Twain that goes, A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Funny thing about that. 
there's reason to doubt that Mark Twain ever said this at all, thus ironically proving the point. And today the quote, whoever said it, is truer than ever before. In previous decades, most media with global reach consisted of several major newspapers and networks which had the resources to gather information directly. Outlets like Reuters and the Associated Press that aggregate or re-report stories were relatively rare compared to today. The speed with which information spreads now has created the ideal conditions for a phenomenon known as circular reporting. This is when publication A publishes misinformation, publication B reprints it, and publication A then cites B as the source for the information. It's also considered a form of circular reporting when multiple publications report on the same initial piece of false information, which then appears to another author as having been verified by multiple sources. For instance, the 1998 publication of a single pseudoscientific paper arguing that routine vaccination of children causes autism inspired an entire anti-vaccination movement, despite the fact that the original paper has repeatedly been discredited by the scientific community. Deliberately unvaccinated children are now contracting contagious diseases that had been virtually eradicated in the United States, with some infections proving fatal. In a slightly less dire example, satirical articles that are formatted to resemble real ones can also be picked up by outlets not in on the joke. For example, a joke article in the reputable British Medical Journal entitled Energy Expenditure in Adolescents Playing New Generation Computer Games has been referenced in serious science publications over 400 times. User-generated content such as wikis are also a common contributor to circular reporting. As more writers come to rely on such pages for quick information, an unverified fact in a wiki page can make its way into a published article that may later be added as a citation for the very same wiki information, making it much harder to debunk. Recent advances in communication technology have had immeasurable benefits in breaking down the barriers between information and people. But our desire for quick answers may overpower the desire to be certain of their validity. And when this bias can be multiplied by billions of people around the world nearly instantaneously, more caution is in order. Avoiding sensationalist media, searching for criticisms of suspicious information, and tracing the original source of a report can help slow down a lie, giving the truth more time to put on its shoes. One side of the political debate is is denying that anybody's trying to influence our elections. But how can you responsibly just forward something when you haven't checked it out, and yet people do it every day, right? We have this thing called cognitive dissonance, OK? Mental conflict that occurs when beliefs or assumptions are contradicted by new information. We don't like it, right? We want quick answers. We want predictability. We don't want to have to think. Cognitive dissonance, and what do we do with that? It's easier to see things in black and white. It's just so much easier. Hillary's the devil, Trump's the God's gift, right? Or the other way around. Why do people feel the need to criticize others? It's when we haven't dealt with our own stuff, right? What do we do in a world where things don't mean the same thing? And I, I understand people have always had perceptions throughout history, but everything's ramped up now. Everything's on steroids because of all the overstimulation we have and all the stuff that's coming at us, right? And it can be overwhelming. And, and technology is neither good nor bad. Technology has no morals, right? The internet is a beautiful thing. It can also be a horribly destructive thing, just like our communication, our words. We can speak encouragement and wonderful life to each other, or we can suck the life out of each other. It might help to have a little humility and understand that we see things from different perspectives. We've reached different conclusions. I like the X factor because the X, what's the X factor? The X factor is all the unknown. And there's always stuff that we don't know. 
And even though I think I'm right, I have to take a step back, exercise a little humility, and, and confess that I don't have the full picture. Okay? We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. To recap, we have selective and incomplete perceptions. We all have confirmation bias, seeking information that confirms what we believe. Um, let me address the news, by the way. Um, I think that we all have a responsibility to have a rich media diet. If you're just getting your news from one or two sources, it would kind of like be, if I could get all the nutrients that I need from two food groups, it would be beer and chips. <laughs> but I would get sick, wouldn't I? I mean, if I just ate beer and chips, it would not be good. We all need a healthy, rich diet. There was a time, I can't remember the instance, but sometime last year where there was a story and I was just like, this isn't making sense. And finally, I heard BBC gave the understanding. I'm like, oh. But most people don't want to work that hard, right? But at least we should be exposing ourselves to different things. We must be aware that changes in law and technology have fundamentally changed where we get information. We socialize with people who are like us. So it's good for us. It's good for us to listen to stuff we don't agree with, and it's good for us to hang out with people that are really different than us. We must know the difference between fact and opinion. We must learn to deal effectively with cognitive dissonance. And we all have it, don't we? We all have these huge inconsistencies in our life, but it's so much easier to point them out than everybody else. We must deal with our shadow selves. So our shadow self is the stuff that we carry around our lives. If I, if I may speak French, it's our shit, right? It's our pains, it's our hang-ups, it's our reactions, it's our stuff. And we have to deal with our shadow selves to be whole people and to bring to the world what only we can bring. Each one of you is so uniquely gifted to bring things to the world that nobody else can bring. But if you're still hung up trying to defend yourself and your dysfunctions, you can't bring it, can you? We must remember there's always an X factor. We need to lean into love. Thank you.